Well, we're headed toward December 25th, aren't we? Celebration of Christmas. And I want to take you to a passage today in God's Word that maybe you've read once or twice before, but you may have not thought about it much when we think about Christmas. Because in this passage that we're going to talk about this morning, there's no mention of Bethlehem. We're not going to read about a manger. Mary and Joseph aren't talked about. No stable. Not even a star. Not shepherds. No wise men. And no baby. How in the world can we talk about Christmas without a manger and a baby and Mary and Joseph and shepherds and angels and stars? And Well, that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to unpack a piece of scripture that is as clear as day in sharing Christmas. So I hope you brought your Bibles with you. If you have them, hold them up. Repeat after me. This is the word of God. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I love the Word of God. Father, again today, we are so thankful for your God-breathed communication to us. The Almighty, everlasting, omnipresent, all-powerful, eternal, holy, righteous God communicated to three-dimensional men made of dust to speak to us clarity and truth that could allow us to spend eternity in heaven. We're so thankful. Today I pray that you will use me in whatever way possible, that your word would be spoken clearly, that people would not remember my words, but they would remember yours. We love you. Pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to have you take your Bibles and open to the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. And we're going to unpack some verses that you may have read before, but like I said, you may not have thought about them much when it comes to Christmas. John chapter 1. And we're going to read the first 14 verses. Again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Follow along. Here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness, that he might bear witness of the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, as we read those verses... Did you hear any mention of Bethlehem? 
How about a stable? A star? How about Mary and Joseph? No. What about shepherds? No. But I hope you caught very clearly the story of Christmas. In fact, it becomes so clear as we get to the end of that section in verse 14. One small verse can tell the entire story of Christmas. In fact, John was so clear, so simple, that he only needed four words to tell the story of Christmas. Four words in English and four words in Greek. Those four words, the word became flesh. The word became flesh. That's a profound truth. The most profound truth of all truths, and that is the truth and the reason we celebrate Christmas. Not because of the physical features of the stable, the manger, and the people that participated, but because the word became flesh. Think about it. John put down these four words in such a simple way that even the smallest child can understand them. And yet these four words are so deep that even the wisest of the wise men in the world today cannot plumb the depths of all that these four words mean. The word became flesh. So as we begin to unpack this section this morning, we come to our first question. Now, as I ask this question, I'm going to ask you a favor. Do not answer it out loud. Okay? That's the biggest temptation. Franco, no. <laughs> That's what T said, Franco. <laughs> That's the biggest temptation is to answer out loud, huh? Because you go, I know the answer. Okay, so we come to our first question of the morning. And again, I'm going to ask you a favor. Do not answer it out loud. Think about it. Ponder it. Let it sit on you for a little while. And then we'll answer it together, okay? So here's our first question for the morning. Who is the Word? Let that ponder for just a minute. Who is the Word? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, we heard these words, and the Word became flesh. Now, hopefully you have an answer that you've come up with, you've thought about, and we're going to do our best to answer that all together. Are you ready? So the question is, who is the Word? And the answer is? Jesus. Very good. The answer is Jesus. Jesus is the Word. Now, John writes all this book, all 21 chapters, to proclaim this truth that Jesus is the Word, that Jesus is God in human flesh. All 21 chapters. And this statement, the Word became flesh, is the most concise statement in all the Bible of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Those four words. The Word became flesh. The infinite became finite. The invisible became visible. The untouchable became touchable. The Word became flesh. 
Now, most of us are pretty familiar with the Christmas story, and we've read it in Matthew and Luke, and we understand all those characters that are involved in the picture, and those characters make the telling of the story of Christmas wonderful and amazing. But the reality of life is, the bottom line, is that those characters just play a role in the story. The bottom line is the story is simply this. The Word became flesh. What we glimpse in those four words is we get a glimpse not of the physical side of what's going on, but the supernatural side of what's happening at this point in time on the timeline of history as God intersects mankind. There is a supernatural event that we get to peek on. Now, when you think about it, the manger wasn't supernatural, was it? Nope. What about Joseph and Mary? Nope. They were just people. What about the shepherds? Not supernatural. Not even the wise men, for that matter. None of that was supernatural. They were just part of the three-dimensional world that we live in. The manger was just wood and hay. Mary and Joseph were just flesh like you and I. Well, the shepherds were just hardworking guys doing their jobs. And the wise men, well, they may have been smart and wealthy, but that doesn't bring supernatural anything, does it? What was supernatural is the supernatural reality that Jesus, the Word, became flesh. Let that sink in. The Word became flesh. This is a non-negotiable reality a non-negotiable reality. The eternal God, the infinite, transcendent, almighty, all-powerful, everlasting, eternal God of the universe became a human being. God became a human being. That's the message of Christmas. God became a human being. We sometimes use the word Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. God with us. Hmm. It's truth. It's a non-negotiable truth. Because without Jesus, there is no hope for forgiveness. And there is no hope for eternal life in heaven. The non-negotiable truth is God became flesh. Without God becoming flesh, there is no hope for eternity in heaven and there is no hope for forgiveness of sins. Make sense? So we've answered our first question of the morning. Who is the Word? The Word is who? Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Which takes us to our next question for the morning. Why... Is he called the Word? Let that sink in for me. Again, don't answer out loud. Why is he called the Word? I mean, why didn't John just go, in the beginning was Jesus? Why didn't he go, in the beginning was Jesus Christ our Lord? Why, didn't, why did he have to say in the beginning was the Word? Couldn't he just be plain and simple for all of us to know and understand? Why did he say in the beginning was the Word? Well, I want you to think about this as a possible answer. The Word, that phrase, in the original language, in the Greek, is the word logos. Logos. Logos is a word that's loaded with tons of meaning, especially in the time when this was written, tons of meaning to both the Gentiles and to the Jews. Logos. Let's talk about the Gentiles first. In the Gentile world, the term logos, well, even before we get there, when we read this word logos, we see it four times. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then we see it down in verse 14, and the word became flesh. So it's used four times, but in those four times, John doesn't answer the question or explain to us why he uses this word, this term, the word. And usually 
Bible scholars say that if a term is used in the Bible and there's no explanation for it, it's because it didn't need to be explained. The people that he was writing to understood what he was saying. So think about this. The Gentiles, when they heard the word logos, they heard this reality. To the Gentiles, the logos was this all-powering source of creation in the universe. That was the logos, this all-powerful source of creation in the universe. The Gentiles heard that word, the logos. That's what they thought of. The logos was the all-powerful, intelligent source of the universe. So as the Gentiles heard this word, John is saying to them, I want you to understand something, Gentiles. The logos is not an unknowable source of power. The logos is a person. The logos is a person. John is saying to his Greek listeners that this logos became a man, and this man is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Logos. That was powerful to the, to the Gentiles. And John was getting that information across to the Jews. The Jews, when they heard the word Logos, they thought of the Old Testament. Because throughout the Old Testament, when the Jews read, they always heard this phrase, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. In fact, I want to take you to a couple places so you can see it. Go to the book of Ezekiel. You probably read that last week, so it's really easy to find. Ezekiel chapter 1. Those of you who are in our Old Testament survey class, you go, I know exactly where Ezekiel is because I've learned how to navigate through my Bible. The book of Ezekiel chapter 1. Now it came about in the 13th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was in the river of Shebar among the exiles, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God on the fifth of the month in the fifth year of King Jehoiachim's exile, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. The word of the Lord. So when the Jews are reading throughout the Old Testament, they see this phrase a number of times. The word of the Lord. Go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. I bet Old Testament survey people know exactly where Jeremiah is. Jeremiah chapter 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priests who were in Analeth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. So what you're going to find as you go through the Old Testament, you're going to see those phrases, the word of the Lord. And to the Jews, the Jewish mind, when they heard the word logos, they always thought back to this phrase, the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord was simply this, God revealing himself to humanity. God revealed himself to Ezekiel, the word of the Lord. God revealed himself to Josiah, he revealed himself to Jeremiah, he revealed himself to Daniel. The word of the Lord, it was God, his will, his truth, his wisdom being revealed to mankind. So when John is writing, he's saying to this, to the Jews and the Gentiles, God discloses himself. He is now incarnate. God is now in the flesh. He's not just a force out there. He's not just an idea. He didn't just reveal himself in the Old Testament, but the Logos has now been made known. You're hearing from God, people. The Word has become flesh. The Logos. So to answer the question, why did, the God, why did God use the term Logos? Because it was such a powerful term that both the Gentile and the Jew mind understood what he was saying. Here's this 
big force, this force of the universe that the Jews and the Gentiles all understood that was out there, John says, guess what? This force is now flesh. God is now flesh. He has now been incarnate, and you can see, touch, and feel him. This was huge to the Jew and the Gentile world. Still with me? Let's go a little bit farther. Understanding this reality that God has become flesh. Now, I want us to understand something very important that the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches this throughout its pages, that God is immutable. Have you heard that term before? Immutable means unchanging. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change, does he? God does not get smarter. Wow, I just learned about nuclear fusion, God says. I just learned about the second law of thermodynamics. No, God knew all that. God does not change. He knows all things. God does not become smarter. God does not become less smart. God does not become stronger or less strong. God is immutable. He never changes. What he does is right, perfect, just all the time. Okay, still with me? So if God doesn't change, when we see and hear these words, and the word became flesh, sometimes people go, well, if God doesn't change, how could he become flesh? That kind of like blows their mind, and they go, that doesn't make sense as they wrestle with this reality. Well, the important thing to understand is that God did not change, because God, fully God, became fully man. Jesus was fully God. God did not change. God, fully God, became fully man and took on flesh, but God never changed. God did not change. He is unchangeable. The eternal God becomes eternal man and speaks through flesh. Wrestle with that and let that sink in for a minute. The eternal, almighty, all-wise God becomes flesh. Now, to take it one more step further before we finish up our morning is the Bible says this, and dwelt among us. God, fully God, became fully man, the almighty, all-powerful, eternal God became flesh, and he dwelt among us. That's key because some people believe that when Jesus was on earth, he was just a phantom. He was just a vision, that he really wasn't there. People were just seeing things. But the Bible says, no, no, no. It wasn't just a vision. It wasn't just an apparition. It wasn't just a phantom. He actually dwelt among people. He actually lived there. He was actually on the earth in fact, the Bible says in Philippians that he was made in the likeness of men. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible says he actually took on flesh. In Colossians, it says all the fullness of deity dwelt in him. God became flesh. God dwells in human form. Now we're going to push the pause button there and go, okay. Let's let that heaviness sink on us just a minute. God, the almighty God of the, the universe, became flesh, the word became flesh, and dwelt among us. See, John wants us to know very clearly what Christmas is all about. It's very simply explained in four simple words. The word became flesh. That's why we celebrate. God, fully God, became fully man and dwelt among us for a very specific reason. So that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. What a privilege. Christmas takes us to hear the word becoming flesh and then broadens out to say, if you believe in Jesus, you'll live forever. Your life will continue on. And today, as we tie up our time together, we're going to celebrate that as we take communion together to be reminded that the Word became flesh. 
When you hold that piece of bread in your hand, we talked a little bit about this in our class this morning, it's unleavened bread because it represents a body without sin. No yeast in it. When you look at the cup, it represents the blood of Jesus that was shed so that your sins and my sins can be forgiven. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And this morning, the men are going to come. They're going to pass the elements. We're going to sit back and just look upon this simple reality that God took on flesh. And because of that, we have hope. And that hope is in Jesus. Go ahead, men. Come on up. They're going to pass the elements. I'm going to ask you to hold on to the bread and the cup. And we're going to share them all together. Jesus Messiah for sinners the ransom from heaven Jesus Messiah Lord of all Lord Jesus as we leave this place today we know in our culture we're headed toward a very important celebration, but in a celebration that so many times culture tries to turn from the reality. And today, as we are reminded, this whole celebration is because of you, because you became flesh. We love you. Pray this in your powerful name, and may we continue to be light and salt, courageous for you. As we walk out these doors, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. You guys have a great and powerful week, and we'll see you back on Sunday. You're dismissed. <laughs>